Hello, I'm Peyton Reed, the director of Bring It On. Thanks for joining us here at the Academy. Thank you to the Academy for uh, hosting. It happens to be the 20th anniversary of the release of Bring It On. Uh, it was August 25th, 2000. Hard to believe 20 years have gone by. And uh, we're here to talk about the movie. I'm gonna be moderating and I would like to introduce a few special guests who are gonna join me today. First off, I would like to introduce the writer of Bring It On, the creator of the Bring It On world, Jessica Bendinger. Hi. <laughs> Hi, JB, what's going on? Oh my God, I'm so excited. Excellent. Uh, we have a couple of other guests. Uh, I would like to uh, deliver a very warm welcome to the head cheerleader of the Clovers, uh, Ms. Gabrielle Union. Hi. Hello. <laughs> I sounded like my mom. Hi. <laughs> exactly. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having uh, me. We have one final guest, uh, the captain of the Toros cheerleading squad, Ms. Kirsten Dunst. Oh, Kirsten. Ch -ch -ch <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> How's everybody doing? How's everybody's quarantine? Doing all right. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess it didn't sound like cheerleaders answering that question. <laughs> yeah, very strange times we find ourselves in. I cannot believe it's been 20 years. It's incredibly strange. And I'm thrilled that you guys are all, everybody's so busy now, um, and weirdly busier now that there's a pandemic on. I'm glad you were all able to make time for, your, for this in your schedules. Thank you. What I'd like to do is just kind of like talk about the journey of the movie. And uh, I'll start with you, Jessica, because... It was your script that started it all. And I want you to talk about a, a little bit, obviously way predating my involvement in the movie, what gave you the idea to write a movie about competitive cheerleading? Well, I was obsessed with those competitions on ESPN and I would watch them. I would like binge them like they were the Kardashians back in the day, the pre-internet 90s. I would just watch them over and over again. And I noticed that they were using a lot of very kind of, um, let's call them homogenized moves that I recognized from hip hop. <laughs> and I was like, this is so funny. This is appropriation. You know, this is um, appropriation on a very strange scale. And so I thought, well, maybe what would happen if, what if, what if, what if? And I kept asking that question and I ended up pitching actually 24 years ago this week, I started pitching Bring It On and I pitched it 28 times. I had 27 no's. By the time I got to Beacon, Universal had already passed in the room. I was like, you guys aren't gonna want this. Nobody wants this, but here goes. And I pitched my little heart out and here we are. When you were telling me how many times you had to pitch the movie, I... it struck me as a really important lesson to you know aspiring screenwriters or directors or anybody about just perseverance. Because yeah. when you go to a studio or anywhere, they mm -hmm. always want a new fresh idea and yet the thing that scares them the most is a new fresh idea. Yeah, that's very well said. I don't think I could have said that better myself. Um, it was, you know, it was, I knew they, were, they would take me to their boss and then their boss's boss. So I knew there was something to the idea and I was also getting good notes the whole time. So the pitch was improving, but I was so inexperienced. You know, I was reading off of 13 pages verbatim, like my hands shaking and just reading my lines um, and trying to sell it. But I'm not a performer, you know, I get very anxious. I'm very anxious here now doing this. I'm not a performer, I get very uncomfortable. And so I was kind of white knuckling my way through it. And by the time I got to the last meeting, John Shestak, who you know, who was a producer on the movie, we'd worked together when I worked in music videos. I had directed hip hop videos and had done some work uh, a couple years earlier. And so I knew him and I relaxed. And I think that was also part of it. Like I was very much myself and the stakes seemed very low. It seemed unlikely anybody would buy it. And lo and behold, here we are. And did you ever experience personally in the cheerleading world or what sort of drew you to that world? What kind of research did you do? Well, I went to camps, I went to competitions. I was kind of lurking, you know, back in the dial-up days of dirty dial-up, like, like rrr, rrr, I, would, I would go on these cheerleading message boards and I'm sure I looked like a creep. Like, I'd be like, hey, can you tell me about, well, like, can I talk to somebody on the phone? And I was stalking these four <laughs> cheerleaders on message boards and somebody finally capitulated and that's how the Wolf's Wall happened. I was like, what is the hardest pyramid known to cheerleader? And they were like, the Wolf's Wall. Um, some other research I did was, uh, I was, Dan Waters, who wrote Heathers, warned me, don't try to make it teen talk. You'll be time stamped right away and everybody will know it's super dated. So try and invent language to your leaders. I mean, teenagers like to invent language. So um, 
I talked to some drag queens in San Francisco and I was like, what's going on in drag world? What's going on in drag culture? What if I infuse that into the script? And it, I, so that was in there. That's in the DNA of the writing of the script after I pitched it. A lot of drag queens, um, a lot of gay men ch trying jokes on them. Like the itch and bitch was something I tried on gay friends and they fell out and I was like, okay, that's good. Um, yeah, it was just a process. And then Gabrielle, I think your involvement with the movie actually predates my involvement with the movie. Cause I know Jessica, you guys did a read through at some point uh, of the script and Gabrielle, you were involved in that. How did that come about? Yeah, I got an early, early, early draft and it was called Cheer Fever. And I think you, you guys probably did more than just the one uh, table read that I did. But um, the only other person I remember being there, uh, even though it was a big, big group of, of uh, young actors, was Ethan Embry, and he was reading Jesse's role. Um, but other than that, I don't, I honestly don't remember. There's probably like, you know, the who's who and the what's what that were in there, and I, I just don't remember. I remembered like, oh, Ethan Embry. <laughs> um, uh, it was very exciting to, uh, to be at a table read with Ethan Embry. He was booking all the things at the time. Um, but yeah, so I, I, and I, the thing I remember about that script was what looked like just a bunch of letters um, kind of strung together and I couldn't figure out what the word was. And my husband at the time, cause there's been more than one husband <laughs> since, uh, and since in our 20 years, <laughs> since I've last seen you guys, there's been more than one. So the, the husband at the time, and I was like, what is this? What is, I don't know what this is. And we were trying to figure it out. and. You know, and he goes, oh, I think they spelled out what um, Martin Lawrence says on, on the Martin show, which is, oh, see what I want. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that was what it was. But the, there was a line that was like, uh, um, uh, me going to owl you. My nails are long, sharp and ready to slash. Um, or yeah, meow, me going to owl you. My nails are long, sharp and ready to slash. Oh, say what I want. Um, you might, you know, you could mix those around, but those were all in there. Um, and then at some the point- The thing was a cheer. It was, ooh, say wada wada, ooh, say wada wada. And it was, I was trying in my ridiculous way to spell that out. <laughs> or that, because I, I, I went with the Martin and the, they got a laugh. So I was like, okay, that must've been it. Uh, or, uh, yeah, yeah. But it, it, it predated uh, you, Peyton. And then, because I don't think there was a director attached at that time. And I thought we were doing that table read for Universal, but I, you know, I've had a lot to drink <laughs> since <laughs> the late 90s. I probably drank more of my memories than I can recall, but yeah. <laughs> but then it was, it felt like shortly thereafter, it all kind of came together and I was offered the role of Isis. And Kirsten, I think even before I came on that you maybe had been offered the role, but we're doing another movie. And I know, I know this is, we're, we're going way back in time. All I know is when I got the movie, I was in New York and I was directing uh, the Upright Citizens Brigade show for Comedy Central at the time. And I found out I got the movie and finished my episode and flew back to LA. And the first thing I had was I had a lunch with an actress who was not you about that role. And mm -hmm. Uh, it was a lovely meeting, and then I left, and Joseph Middleton, uh, who cast the movie, said, uh, well, you should know um, she's up for another movie. I was like, oh, okay. And Joseph said, um, she's actually up for another cheerleader movie. And my first reaction was, oh, wait, hold on a second. There's another, there's another cheerleader movie? What's going on? And anyway, that actor passed on our movie and did the other cheerleader movie. There was another. And oh, wait, I remember. It was like a violent one, right? Yeah. Well, sugar and spice. That's sugar right. and spice. They were bank robbing cheerleaders. That's right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And wait, Gabrielle, you read for that movie or no? Did they? I want. I wanted that. I to this day. I mean, there's still something in the back of my mind. All those jobs to, you don't to this get. Day, you like, wish you'd done my the life would have been <laughs> had I just gotten that. But yeah, they had. It was like 172 cheerleader leads in that movie, and they couldn't. They they would not make not a one black. So. I, I, with my tail between my legs, I was like, I guess, bring it on, I you guess. know, maybe bring it on, we'll become something. And I now, guess I'll do that other cheerleader movie. Damn it. <laughs> yeah, it's, and, and, and Kirsten, I remember like, 
after that happened, then it was like, well, who are we going to go to? I was like, I want Kirsten Dunst. And I think they said, well, she passed. And I said, well, I want, let me talk to her because, you know, Jessica and I had done more work on the script and, and you were, were you in the Czech Republic? You were so, you know, I was in Prague doing like this really crappy movie. Um, and yeah, I remember talking, I just like, my head wasn't, or I, I watched those competitions too, that Jessica was talking about, like me and my girlfriends, my best friend Molly would watch them because I was a cheerleader in eighth grade. So like, I definitely was fascinated by those two. Um, but yeah, I kind of like, it was a risk. Like we were this little, oh, yeah. that he really gave two shits about, right? I mean, I really felt like we were just like this to go to your thing, right? Yeah. Well, it was interesting because I, I, well, I'll back up and say when I first got the call, because I'd been looking for a movie to do, I'd done a bunch of television and my agent called and said, Hey, I know you, you were looking for a movie and I know you had talked about doing a high school movie. And I got this script in, what's it called? It's called Cheer Fever. I was like, what is that? And he said, it's a movie about competitive high school cheerleading. And my first, you know, I had not really been looking for a cheerleader movie specifically, but I said, send it. And, and I was, when I read it, I was really struck in those first two pages, which had that opening cheer. And I was really struck by that. And I think it kind of remained verbatim in, in the final movie. But the idea that in like two or three pages, it immediately confronted your preconceived notions about cheerleaders yeah. And it was a musical and it was so in your face and interesting and it was written with such attitude and, and energy um, and that I got excited about. It. And it was this whole subculture I knew nothing about. And then as you weren't further along, it started dealing with some themes that were like, oh, holy shit, this is interesting in a high school movie. This is different. And, uh, and I got really excited Kirsten about it. keeps raising her hand, Peyton. Well, only because I actually <laughs> kind of remember, I'm just recalling everything now. Like, I remember the reason I did the movie is talking to Peyton. I was like, he's so cool and smart, and he's going to do something really special with this. That's what I did think when I talked to Peyton. I had no idea what we were going to do with it. No, I, I, I really, I, all I knew is that, like, I liked Jessica's dialogue, and the characters were so stylized, but it had to be grounded in reality. Because when it sort of starts dealing with cultural appropriation and all those issues that are, you know, much more serious, you, you couldn't take a hard left turn. The movie had to kind of seed it in there. Um, and you like you didn't like the 120 page version. Of the saga. Yeah, there talking was about the 120 page version. version of the script that I was like so passionate about. Thank God you talked me off the ledge multiple times. There was one that dealt with, yeah, the hierarchy of the cheerleaders and the dance squad and all of this stuff. It was, it was, it was large. But, you know, I, I actually, like, looking back at the movie and what we were trying to do, the movie would have been a failure without you guys, Gabrielle and Kirsten, Jesse, Eliza, all the other actors who created real characters. And um, my memory of it is, like, the casting was such a crucial thing and casting people who could deal with the comedy and the drama and of course the physical demands of the movie. But you guys were so amazing at such a young age and willing to kind of help me navigate that movie because we were touching on some interesting subjects and some tricky subjects, um, which I like to think is part of why people might still be talking about the movie 20 years later. Um, but I remember wanting it to be real amidst all the sort of stylized stuff and I wanted it to be fun but also you know it was good that we didn't shy away from some of these issues and and that was always kind of what struck me in Jessica's original draft that that's what made the movie different and interesting to me um and Gabrielle I just remember us having conversations in the trailer and stuff about all the you know the character and and what we wanted to do with Isis and the whole idea and you mentioned to me at one point I think Gabrielle that in the years since I don't know if it was a journalist or someone who talked about a perception of ISIS being a villain or talk, talk about that because that's a very strange read on the movie and the character, but I, I want to talk about it. It's a strange read, but it's so common, turns out. Um, even just more recently with those memes that it was like the movie's villain and then it was like the real villain. And in our meme for Bring It On, it said the, the movie's villain and it had a picture of my, you know, me. And then it was like the real villain. And it was a picture of, you know, Lindsay as, as Big Red. And I was like, okay, so this isn't like something that a journalist made up. This is like in pop culture, I guess. I'm like, I guess ISIS was the villain. And, and I thought how 
wild it is because like, and over, over the years, um, you know, it's, it's the gift that keeps on giving. And, and I'm, I'm asked about it constantly for the last 20 years, but it is received very differently from communities of color and from white folks. And, but it, no one has ever said it to my face that they thought I was a villain. They've said that, oh, I thought the, the Toro should have won or you were, so, you were such a hard ass, but I never thought about her as being a villain for wanting equality and accountability and, and an equal playing field and to have to be recognized for you know, her squad's contributions. It never occurred to me that anyone could be demonized for that, but I don't know why, because that's actually life. But it, it is very interesting uh, how different, different ethnicities um, and, and if, whether if you're a part of a marginalized group, how you receive um, the clovers versus the toros and, and uh, who you're rooting for and why. And those, it's, it's just very different. It's very, very different. Yeah. And I think it's, I mean, obviously it's really telling about the attitudes in the country back then and certainly now. And there is, I suppose, a depressing aspect of it that more hasn't changed. I mean, these, these issues of, you know, cultural appropriation and all those issues were around long before our movie and continue after our movie. But I, I do have, I have memories of people talking in sort of coded language to me over the years about like, but well, the tours were they were really good. They, I mean, shouldn't they have won the, the thing? It's like, no, 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 no. That's not what the story's about at all. And that's, it's, it's a big tell when people talk to you about that. Yeah, I mean, we stole all their shit, <laughs> all, their, yeah. all their dances and yeah. everything. It's like, duh. I mean, it's interesting because Kirsten, now you, you know, with sort of the language of 2020, yeah. you, know, you, can, you can look at Torrance very clearly and she is a poster girl for white privilege. She learns her lesson though, right? Yeah, and also like fucks up along the way, you yeah. know, tries to make it right. And I, I always, I, I, um, I love the scene how you guys performed it when, when uh, Torrance goes to the Clover's Gym and they have the, the scene about she's gotten her dad's company to write a check to get the Clover's in. And in her mind and her sort of white privilege bubble, it's like, oh, okay, I'm doing a great thing. Mm -hmm. Not thinking for a second about how that is going to be received on the other end of it. Yeah. And that strikes me now as you sort of like, we're talking about white fragility and, you know, there are books for white people about how to <laughs> talk about race because Americans are so uncomfortable talking about race. Um, I like that scene. And I think I, I remember us talking about like trying to get at the truth of it. And also that it really is about, you know, these, these rivals and sort of, this desire to have a level playing field, but it's not easy. And it's also like, you know, ISIS doesn't want Torrance's charity at that point. They want to get there on their own merits and prove to, you know, prove what they already know, that they're the best. And in, in terms of a structure for the story, <clears throat> you know, it had a sort of rocky structure where in the first Rocky, he doesn't beat Apollo Creed, but his victory in that movie is he goes the distance. And in this one, you know, for, for Torrance, I think it was the idea that, like, they, they got there on their own merits. Um, but, you know, the Clovers were always the best. But it's very, it's fascinating to see how people sort of perceive that ending and that arc um, back then and even now. Do you guys remember shooting that in that, in that uh, gym? I do. Yeah, I do, too, for some I reason. do, too. <laughs> I really do. You're right. Like, you rip up the check, Right. Remember, yeah. I, there was a take where I ripped yeah. it up and, and, I, it, and it, got stuck on, it got stuck on you. On my face or on my... <laughs> on your hair. That's stuck I, in your hair. I, it got I, stuck I on, your, on you. Um, and we were like, are, are we supposed to get it off? Are we going to leave it there? <laughs> Is that funny that it's like stuck to her? You should have used that take, Peyton. I think, it's in the, uh, I think it's in the outtakes at the end during Mickey when you guys were doing the cheer for, for Mickey. I see that scene and I think about the girls from Black. I think about Natina, obviously, and Shamari and Brandy and, and how much I miss Natina. She was just a force of nature. Uh, and, that, and how you were such a good mentor, Gabrielle, to them. I remember the first day we were shooting with them, it was the scene outside at night. Uh, the first confrontation and on those early takes those girls were looking right in the lens and I'm looking at the monitors like is it just <laughs> are they looking in the lens and I realized that they were used to just doing music videos where they are just like singing right into the lens and I had to have the conversation with them you know look at 
and listen to the person talking. It was fantastic, and they were so great. I remember that night, and I and my my friends had come in town to visit me, and they were kind of near Video Village. And I remember Dulé Hill, who had come, who you know, he was Charlie on the West Wing, and and he's on Psych and a thousand other things. And Dulé was like, they're looking at the fucking camera, and I was like. No, 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 no. I mean, yeah, no, we're going to get, we're going to, we're going to get that. And Peyton was like, okay, yeah, I, I didn't, I wasn't, I was like, I got it, I got it, I got it. So it's like, okay, guys. So, but it's like, it was fascinating that they literally got plucked from tour with sync. They yeah. had been on tour around the world, no breaks, no vacation. They were over each other. They like, they yeah. were, they were over each other. <laughs> and they're, and they're young girls, right? And like, there was only like uh, Brandy's dad just, you know, just Brandy's dad. And so they were like, didn't really have like parents and they were, they were freaking over it. And so they were looking at this as like their escape. And I was like, yes, I want you guys to have, I want you to ball the freak out. I need you to be on time. Like, yeah. I don't care what you do. I don't care if you roll into work, but like, you gotta be on time. And like, so like, don't look at the camera. <laughs> like, just don't, just don't look at the camera. Well, like Kirsten, she's close to the camera. But look yeah. at her. Don't look at the camera. <laughs> I mean, they were so young. I mean, you guys were all so young, but they were young. Like, Kirsten, you had just turned 17 when we started shooting the movie. Yeah, I felt like the baby, too. Like, I remember, because I was, my mom was with me. Yeah. I wasn't 18 yet. So, like, yeah, yeah. it was my mom, my brother, and I living in San Diego. Everyone else was, like, in hotel rooms partying, I feel like. Yeah. But, I would, like, and some, but some nights we would go, like, your mom, you and your mom would invite us. And we'd be like, okay, we gotta, we gotta go out. Cause you guys weren't, you guys were like in Lo, like La Jolla. Oh, yeah. yeah, we had a and house. So we would drive out to La Jolla yeah. and hang out at like, we'd have like soda and like, you know, chips and like, you know, very PG. <laughs> and then we're like plotting of like what bars we were gonna like, you know, I was gonna try to get the girls into who didn't have fake IDs. I felt like a camp counselor that entire summer. I mean, that's really, it was my first movie and I was just, hell bent on getting the movie done and making it as great as it could be. And I benefited so much from just the youthful energy of all of you on that movie, because everyone was so psyched to be there and just dug into all the physical demands of everything. And, and I just have this idyllic uh, feeling about that movie, which is obviously helped by the fact that, you know, when the movie was done, we were coming out with a competitive cheerleader comedy. We were going up against, I think it was Wesley Snipes, The Art of War, which of course, everyone who bets on these things was like, well, of course that movie's gonna be number one, but how far down are we gonna be? And we ended up being number one for a couple of weeks in a row. And it was just, um, it was insane. I don't think that's, oh yeah, maybe once in my life. I was like, that was the, that was the craziest thing. I remember going with you, Peyton, at Universal Studios and like we would theater hop, right? And see. Yeah. That was so fun. In the I remember you tearing up, Kirsten. Tearing up? You're on a cell phone, I guess, to one of your reps. You're like, I have my first number one movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so, yeah, I, I'm curious how, uh, in the 20 years since, uh, how many people come up and are in your face and want you to do cheers and all of that stuff? How has it really sort of affected you? Because you guys have all done so much since that movie. Do people still talk to you about cheerleading? Yeah? <laughs> you want to go first, Kevin? No, no, you go first. You go first. I mean, yeah, people will come up and just, quote, bring it on to me and everything. I mean, to me, it's just such a sense of pride because we did work hard. It wasn't, like, a huge budget. We were, we, we really proved ourselves. And, like, it was genuine hard work with such, like, good hearts behind it, you know? And I think that that it, it that doesn't happen all the time. It feels so good when it's like a good group of people and then we're, you know, all successful together. So yeah, I, I get asked, I'm like, you know, I I can't do cheers on the spot for people. I can't do that. <laughs> but yeah. I, I, I won't ask you to. I get quoted, you know what I mean? Even my best girlfriends, some of their favorite, like I'll get the door tour. Like they do it to me. <laughs> <laughs> like it's just because it's a part of our, you know, growing up for a yeah. lot of well, it's part of our youth, you know. And, no, I, and I don't, I don't remember the cheers, uh, and I don't remember like a lot of the. 
a lot of the dialogue I, I've been doing bad things so my brain cells are like <laughs> oh Ma'am, we have no idea um, but Wait, like I saw you recently <laughs> doing burr it's cold in here I just well, I had to learn it for Jerry because I knew he was gonna be doing it so I didn't want him to be strung out there like by himself <laughs> But like, that usually I get quoted uh, lines that actually are not in our movie, that they're actually in not another teen movie and they'll do oh, yeah. the whole thing. And it was actually one of my girlfriends who, you know, spoofed me, um, her name's Trina Shavers. And, and so her version of me doing it, it was like, it's already been brought. In. And I was like, that is not in our movie. I never said that. And they were like, no, no, you did. You absolutely did. I'm like, no, I, I did not. It's You're in like the spoof. You're like, oh yeah, I saw that movie. That was great. Okay, I think we have some fan questions that I've been given here from social media. And uh, I'm gonna start with, let's see. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Okay, um, did you take inspiration? This is from Nicholas. Did you take inspiration from other iconic teen roles while filming Bring It On? I didn't, but I don't do that with any movie. Like I would, well, I do actually like movies that I like, like take inspiration from it, but not specifically, not with Bring It On, no. Yeah. No, I didn't. Gabrielle? No, I mean, it was just, she, she's very, she's, she's a lot like me, I'd like to think. Um, <laughs> like she's not with the shits, she's over it, and it's, it's a new day. Um, not a lot has changed, guys. Uh, but what I, I remember what I did, because I was coming off of the summer before we'd done, we'd done 10 Things I Hate About You and She's All That, and I didn't want to do those again. So right. um, I just remember at the end of our script, you know, uh, Torrance and Isis end up at Cal Berkeley cheering together. Mm -hmm. So I kind of went backwards, like having graduated from UCLA, knowing what it took at that time to get into the UC system, trying to like, you know, infuse ISIS with, you know, the, the necessary, you know, characteristics that would have allowed her to, to go to, you know, Berkeley at that time. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I, again, I just think like the two of you as the captains of those teams, I just, there's, it's impossible for me to imagine any other version of this movie uh, with anyone else. You guys inhabited those roles beyond belief. Uh, all right. Here's another one. Bring on asks a lot of tough questions and does it better than a lot of movies aimed at older audiences. Um, over time, have critics and audiences engaged with, with its themes as much as it deserves? This is from Amy. Gabrielle? Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think because, uh, certainly with my, the, my career trajectory and a lot of the themes that, that a lot of the films I've been a part of have, have covered, this is right in there um, in, in really examining race, gender, um, identity, um, sexuality, um, and, and, real, and, a, and a sense of worthiness. Like all of those themes are, are, are kind of um, in this. And so it's, it's, it's withstood the test of time. Now there are certain aspects where people um, you know, may judge us more critically or have, uh, you know, follow up questions that like, well, maybe you'll address this in the sequel. But I'm like, okay, um, sure. Whenever we get to that sequel that hasn't been done in the 80 sequels that came before us. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in, in terms of the larger issues, um, we get a lot of, a lot of uh, kudos for being ahead of the, ahead of the curve and, and dealing with it head on and not, not in a soft way. And especially the idea of, of Torrance, even after she apologizes, you know, apologizes for, you know, um, big red, you know, stealing from, from the, the clovers, that doesn't absolve her. her. Her naivete, her innocence, her apology does not absolve her from, you know, consequences. And people are still, they still marvel at that because you know, in, in the last 20 years, we've seen, you know, bits of this uh, topic covered um, to, to varying degrees of, of uh, no success. Um, but, you know, we, we stand, the t we for sure stand the test of time. Um, but they do have questions about like, you know, dialogue and, and, and the collaborative nature of 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 how we got it done and what really, you know, what it really looked like and what really went into that. And that was, I mean, that was amazing. I think, you know, I encourage, I think all the actors to bring themselves to the roles and, and you all did. And Gabrielle, I think you really, you know, you were really, I know you were helpful to me in sort of 
navigating that and doing in all those things, kind of bringing a reality and trying to do it in what felt like a genuine way, because we didn't want to do a movie that was sort of this frothy comedy. And then when it attempted to deal with more serious themes, just like fell on its face. And that's, yeah. that's something I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy with sort of how we did it. Um, yeah. I mean, and we were, and we were aided by, you know, Gary Hardwick who, you know, after, you know, he helped us with this, he, you know, I went on to do a couple other projects with him, um, you know, because again, it's, it's, it's a conversation that we're still having now when you have uh, interracial uh, writing, you know, um, you know, we talk about this with, with um, animated characters and, and who's allowed to write for what and, and to, and, and should you be allowed to write, you know, uh, interracially and uh, you know, so it's it's a conversation that's still com you know completely relevant and timely. Um, but the reality is, like we we did need we did need you know some help, and and Gary Hardwick was uh, you know kind enough to dive in and and you know to give us to give us a leg up and a you know a first person voice for you know a lot of our a lot of our our dialogue as as the covers. Yeah, and I think it's tricky. And Jessica, we can talk about that too, because I mean, I remember even at the time as a white guy making a, a cheerleader movie that dealt with issues of race. Um, it's so fraught and it's kind of a microcosm for America and how it's very hard. I mean, I don't know if you've read White Fragility or seen the lecture on it, but like the idea of like white people don't know how to talk about race. Yeah. A combination of just like guilt or shame or... Uh, yeah. All of the above, all of the above. We're like very clunkily coming of age, you know. Production is a team sport and we're always doing punch up on movies and uh, it's such a collective effort. And when the actor feels comfortable, the difference is palpable, right? And so that was the case here and it all worked out. It yeah. all worked out. And I'm also very proud that certain things that I tried my best st are, were there in the pitch and they're there in the final script. Like a lot of what I wrote is still there. And it's like, you build the house, you do the blueprint and then the furniture is going to move around a little bit. You know, and so there are some great pieces of furniture here and there, but it's, um, I'm very proud of the movie. I worked for it six years total. So it's, I, I worked really hard on it. I did my best, I did my level best. And then you have to go, okay, what's the process here and how can we make it even better? Yeah. And I also think that, you know, if we were making Bring It On Now, 20 years later, it would be from an entirely different perspective. You would want it to be. It's just, it's, you know, in that regard, I, I it's certainly a product of its era 20 years ago. Um, and I think it's interesting to talk about, we've kind of talked around it, but the idea of like, if there were gonna be further in this world of streaming or whatever, newer sort of bring it on things. The idea to sort of, we've talked about sort of what that movie, it means one thing to white kids who saw it when it came out, another thing to black kids when they saw it when it came out and queer kids and like just all these different, you know, groups and how it really carries a different meaning and different weight for all of them. And if you were gonna do new stories, you know, it would be, you'd wanna find new, young, hungry voices who are not only tapped into current pop culture, as I no longer am, clearly, but, but like the idea of like really kind of hearing, you know, it's, it's, it's what the industry is trying to do, hopefully finally, is embrace new voices and a range of new voices because that is America. And that's, that's exciting to me. I mean, did you guys all watch Cheer, the, the docu-series? Yes. Was, oh, my God. It was amazing. amazing. Oh, I'm obsessed. Loved it. Loved and that queer kids were front and center. You know, that made me so happy to see kids, you know, kids of color and queer kids just like, I felt like a grandparent, you know, like, oh, it, you know, what we made worked out and people were inspired and people just did it. It felt so good to see them succeeding at such a high level. I was like, that was not there when I was going to competitions. <laughs> that was not there. That was not what it looked like. And to see the difference, I was so, I'm so enormously pleased. Yeah. Yeah. I watched it and when someone would come on and, and had three or four concussions and was still thinking about continuing with the cheerleading, there was a part of me, I, I looked over at my wife and I was like, am I in some way responsible for that? Am I in some way responsible for inspiring these kids to get multiple concussions? <laughs> and it took me back to when we were shooting the thing for all of those final cheer things. When the cheerleaders do it for real, they, you know, they practice and they rehearse and they go out and they do the routine once. But you guys had to do it multiple times so we could get all the camera angles. And I was terrified 
that someone was going to break an ankle or get a concussion. I can't. You guys scared? What's that? Anyone end up hurting themselves? I think we had one ankle from one of the cheerleaders who was, I can't remember if it was a Toro's or a Clover's injury. I think it was a Toro's injury. I had a stunt double for some of it. Yeah. I was a flyer in high school. So I, I, as you, I don't know. I felt like I was pretty used to certain things, but I could, I just couldn't like do backflips or anything like that. Yeah. I, I sucked. Like I, you guys had to cut around me. And I always say, I'm like, don't look at the wide shot because I'm not going to match anybody. (laughs) There's a lot of tight shots. I'm like, oh, yeah. And then I was just sort of hidden, like where I was weaker. Like you're like, just keep dancing, Gab. Just keep dancing. Let the other kids do all the stunts. You'll be fine off in the corner, further in the corner, further. You were great. I remember there are plenty of wide shots. You were really good. I was there. I was there when they were shooting that day. You were fantastic. You were both fantastic. Oh, yeah. I just remember feeling so old and I was older than everyone else, but I just remember smelling of icy hot and like tiger bomb. And everyone's like, who is that? I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> just like, Oh my God. And I remember the, the scene where I have to get up from that, from the gym to get up and like walk over to you. And you know, I rip up the check thinking how badly my hips hurt sitting on the ground. Yeah. It's all the random oh, things that come back to me. I was like 27, 28. Oh, whoa, okay. You were 27. Yeah. I didn't realize you were that old. I didn't realize you were that old. Yeah, I felt like I was like 10 years older than you. And I think you were 17, so I was like 27. But yeah, I just remember like, I, like everyone's like, what was the hardest part? I'm like getting up off the ground to rip up a check. Um, <laughs> and also people don't think that when we were shooting those, uh, those nationals routines, we were shooting in Oceanside, California for Orlando, and it was blazing hot. It was so hot. It was that oh bad. My God. We were on the beach though, right? Weren't we on the beach? Yeah, we were on the beach. We were on the beach, but we're in those bleachers and there was no shade. There was only a little bit of shade depending on the time. And we were chasing the, the, the light, like. Oh, oh yeah. Um, change as the yeah. sun would like come over the, oh yeah, I remember that, you're right. Yeah. I remember, and you guys kept saying, we can change the ending at any time. We can change the ending <laughs> to try to get us to go full out every time. Oh, as a threat? Who said that? Did I say that? We can change the ending at any time? Was that me? I don't remember if it was, I mean, it was said a lot because we were like, we got to come I on. I know, that's <laughs> awful. That, <laughs> they'll change uh, the ending that's if we terrible. Stop. If that's true. Oh, not me. I don't remember I'm saying I'm filing that. a complaint. That is terrible. No, no, no. I, <laughs> yeah. I, no. That's, uh, that was not me. What I must have said, <laughs> I know. Um, but no, I remember there being this sort of, you know, it was this challenge with the Toro's final thing and the Clovers, because you had to come up to, the audience had to come to that moment not really knowing who's gonna win in terms of like the competition and stuff. That and that the, the routines had very different characters, but also in my head was, we had moves in there that were illegal on a high school level and only a collegiate level. And I couldn't, it was hard to keep all that stuff straight. And I'm sure Jessica cheerleaders have probably come up to you over the years and said like, well, they couldn't do that thing that violates the UCA. Oh, there's so many. Yeah. The more illegal though, the more entertaining it was. So yeah, yeah, I think the cheerleading, I think the stunt court, the cheer coordinators all wanted to do like all the stuff they couldn't do in competition. Yeah. But yeah. I remember in editorial, it became this thing about how, you know, we wanted them both to be so good and trying to find those things. And people were saying, well, what was the point? Where would they lose points in a routine? And someone, it was, it was crazy sort of from that prism of trying to be true to cheerleading rules. Because it wasn't like doing a basketball movie or a baseball movie where I kind of know what the rules are. Yeah. Yeah, I needed help in that regard. What else? Roger Ebert called it the Citizen Kane of cheerleading movies. I'll take that, <laughs> why not? <laughs> After he gave us a bad review when we opened. I want to say he gave, us a thumbs up. he gave us a thumbs up, but he also fixated on the um, during that period of time, PG 13 movies that were, as he said, like cut to within an edge of like being an R yeah. movie and pushing it in that way, which I think was, was the trend at the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah. he was my neighbor. He was our neighbor in Chicago and my dad, it wasn't a great review. It was just like, eh. and my yeah. dad saw him at the grocery store carnival grocery and was like, um, Roger. Yeah, no. <laughs> and so I love that he revised his opinion. He came out with a more positive opinion, especially after, after all, as you pointed out, his Russ Meyer work and all those kind of faster pussycat movie, kill, kill movies he worked on. 
Um, yeah, he, was, he came he was to love great. us. He came to compliment us, which makes me very happy. The fact that um, people even think about a movie that we made 20 years ago is nice. Yes. I will take that. And also if it's sort of, if it's anybody's like first tiny dip of the toe into awareness and sort of, you know, looking at the truth of the world around you. I, I, when I was reading ta Coates' uh, book and he talks about white Americans living in what he called the dream. And it's this sort of like white picket fence and everybody, you know, white kids living in this sort of bubble, not knowing that everything they have is built on the backs of slavery. Well, let's say genocide first and then slavery, the sort of dark past of America. Like if, if it maybe inspires some kid to actually get real and talk truthful about our country, that's a whole nother Academy uh, Zoom webinar we can do. <laughs> but um who knows? I don't know. We, uh, we touched on a little something. I mean, all you can do is open the door and, and you have to hope that people will, uh, you know, gladly walk through the door because they want to do better once they know better. Um, but there's, I mean, there, we could like, there's, there's, there's so many oh, essays yeah. and op-eds that could be written off of, this, <laughs> off of this movie and have been and, and, and the, you know, the, the impact 20 years later and that it, that it had and that it continues to have. And that's, that's awesome. And so whatever that we may one day come up with, I don't know, maybe, I mean, Kirsten, maybe we're like I'm head of the, co-head of the PTA and I don't know. I don't, I don't know. What are we? Or we run a cheer school like cheer or? Like cheer. Oh, who knows? Where we decide who's on the mat. Yeah. The would-be Jerry's of the world. I don't know. I feel like it'd be fun if we, I mean, it has to be a competition against somebody now. And Jessica, again, none of us would be here now if it weren't your idea to make a movie. Thank you for uh, elevating it. You guys all <laughs> elevated it to the highest possible end. And I'm so, you know, it's so, it's such, it makes me so happy. You guys are amazing. I can't imagine anybody else. I can't imagine dreaming up better people. Director Peyton, Isis, Gabrielle, Torrance, Kirsten. It's like a dream come true for a writer. So thank you guys. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you. Thanks. And what's up, Eliza and Jesse? Hey, Eliza and, and, Jesse. and, and everybody. Eliza, Claire Jesse, and everybody. Nathan, everybody. Rini, all of them. Binding. Yeah, yeah. All the, all the crew. I know. I think we did that reunion picture not that long ago. It feels like that. But what, was that 15 years we did that? I think it was five years. I think years. that was like, yeah, was that five years ago? Okay. Yeah. 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 Builder yeah. back. Oh my gosh, everybody, all the oh, crew. Man. So we have to get everybody together for yeah. like Zoom cocktails or something. <laughs> yeah, when people can actually uh, be with people again in yeah. the world, it would be great. Or virtual cocktails. We'll just drink <laughs> like we were in San Diego. Yeah. But not you, Kirsten. Not me. Yeah. <laughs> but with your mom. Uh, your mom would slide in a couple. I know. I was going to say, I'm sure my mom would have given you guys a few. She was, she was very kind. Yeah, I would think not so. In eye, not in your eyesight, but your mom was she, very she cool was. on the low. She's I'm waiting for your mom to pop into this Zoom call. <laughs> I don't live with that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. This was fantastic. All right. All right, guys. Bye. Happy Bye. anniversary. Bye. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Bye. Bye.